First of all, for everybody here, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Ed Bolin, President and CEO of the National Business Association. Uh, prior to joining the NBAA, uh, he was president and CEO of the General Aviation Manufacturers Association. He held that job for eight years. He was then appointed uh, by President Bush to serve as a member of the Commission of the Future of the U.S. Aerospace Industry. And uh, that was established by Congress and the Commission's objectives were to study and make recommendations on ways to ensure American leadership in aerospace in the 21st industry. Now later, he was nominated by President Clinton and confirmed by the U.S. Senate to serve as a member of the Management Advisory Council to the Federal Aviation Association. That's the FAA for all of you not doing acronyms. Uh, <laughs> that's something I'd like to do, Ed, if we get a chance. I sure would like to give some advice to FAA, but we're not going there now. Uh, by the way, he chaired that council from 2000 to 2004. He's a member of the board of directors of the National Aeronautic Association, and he serves on the Aviation Advisory Board of Mitra Corporation, a federally funded research and development corporation. Now, prior to his career in associations, he was the general or my majority general counsel to what is now the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. He also served as a legislative director for uh, U.S. Senator Nancy Katzenbaum and was a key player in the passage of the General Aviation Revitalization Act. Now, Mr. Bowen received his Bachelor of Arts degree in economics at University of Kansas. Uh, that's to be commended, Ed. I got mine at uh, University of Nebraska, but that's all right. Uh, we had a better football team. Yeah, there, there's no uh, parochialism in this uh, school at all, none. And uh, he did receive his law degree from Tulane and holds a Master's of Laws from Georgetown University Law Center. So just from this brief introduction, it's apparent that we are dealing with a man of stature, a man who has played an instrumental part in developing aviation throughout the United States, and he's done so for an appreciably long time. So on behalf of the Auburn University, I'd like to welcome you aboard, Ed, and we will now turn this over to you. Thank you very much. Well, Dr. Witte, thank you for uh, that very generous and kind introduction, and thank you uh, in the entire leadership team down at Auburn for giving me the opportunity to be with you today as Auburn uh, celebrates its Business Aviation Week. Uh, I wish we could be there in person. Uh, you know, I have, I, it's, it's probably been a decade since I have been on campus in Auburn, uh, but I did take an opportunity to do a virtual tour uh, earlier today and, and uh, a shout out and thank you to, uh, to Christian and, uh, and to Ashton who uh, were the striped wing ambassadors that gave the tour, but it is really impressive uh, to see what is going on. The, uh, the physical layout, the simulators, the aircraft, uh, and of course the programming that is being done is very, very impressive. Um, while I couldn't be there in person, none of us could, I did want to celebrate uh, by wearing my Auburn University Aviation t-shirt. I think Brock Gordon designed that for last year's event, um, and I have been waiting to wear that on campus, but uh, I'll, I'll just wear it uh, today on the Zoom call. Uh, but I just uh, really want to underscore how impressed I am with everything that it, Auburn is doing uh, for all of aviation, but particularly for business aviation. And that's obviously where I'm gonna focus my remarks today. Uh, now, to be clear, when I talk about business aviation and NBAA's 11,000 members in the business aviation community, I will be using a broad definition of business aviation. The actual definition, of course, is the use of 
any general aviation aircraft for a business purpose. Uh, so I know a lot of people think about Fortune 500 companies uh, flying ultra long range uh, business jets, but the reality is NBA's 11,000 members uh, do include the Fortune 500 companies, but 85% of our members are small and mid-sized companies. Um, some of the companies you've heard of, uh, Bass Pro Shops, uh, Red Wing Boots, Jack Links, Beef Jerky, uh, Enterprise Car Rental, John Deere, but most of the companies you haven't heard of. They're small and mid-sized companies, but they're operating everywhere in the United States. Large cities, rural communities, their operations differ and their aircraft differ. But when you put it all together, every member of NBAA relies <clears throat> on general aviation to meet at least some portion of their transportation challenges. So it is a very diverse community, but it also is a community that has something very fundamental in common, and that is its dependence on our general aviation system, or in fact, our entire aviation system in the United States. I thought I might uh, spend just a little minute to tell you kind of where NBA 8 came from, so you know a little bit about our history and our purpose today. Uh, NBA was created right after World War II. I think there were a number of companies at the time, oil companies, uh, manufacturing companies, and others that realized in the buildup to World War II and during World War II, they had come to rely on general aviation aircraft to get them to the oil patch or to deliver products and services or to have remote facilities. And they were concerned after World War II that maybe access to airports or air pay, airspace would be constricted, uh, that maybe some of our airports would go away after World War II, or that some of the airspace might be given priority uh, to large commercial carriers. So NBA started after World War II uh, specifically to protect and promote our access to airports and to air Space, to enhance safety and to ensure professionalism in all business aviation did. And so fast forward almost 75 years and a lot of what NBAA is doing today is very similar to what we were chartered to do just after World War II. NBAA's specific mission, our reason to exist is to foster an environment that allows business aviation to thrive in the United States and around the world. So when you think about our community and NBAA's role as a trade association, understand our purpose, our reason to exist is to foster an environment that allows business aviation to thrive in the United States and around the world. So how do we do that? Well, we do it a number of ways. We look to try to influence or pass legislation that we think will stimulate the industry, or we try to stop legislation that we think would kill the industry. So uh, Dr. Witte mentioned uh, that I worked on Capitol Hill and was part of the passage of the General Aviation Revitalization Act. <laughs> was legislation that said we need to reform the product liability laws related to general aviation aircraft so the manufacturers will be encouraged to build uh, piston-powered airplanes and sell piston-powered airplanes. It's an example of finding a way to stimulate our industry. More recently, we were involved in passage of the CARES Act, the, the stimulus package that provided loans and grants to commercial aviation operators. Of course, the, the large airlines, uh, but also part 135 commercial carriers. Uh, that legislation produced over $700 million worth of grants and loans uh, to the general aviation industry through the part 135 operators. It also included about $100 million 
for general aviation airports. So we work hard on legislation that will help our industry. And of course, we work to stop legislation that we think would harm or kill our industry. We also work aggressively on regulations. So a recent example of that uh, has been the proficiency and the medicals that are required to operate um, in our industry. Uh, the proficiency checks that were coming due in the middle of COVID or the medicals uh, were something that people were not gonna be able to necessarily get into a simulator or get to the doctor's office and have the check. So we've worked very closely with the FAA to extend those regulations so, um, so that people could have additional time to do their proficiency checks or their medical checks. Uh, currently, we're working on um, a regulation related to pilot uh, record data keeping, uh, pilot record database. Uh, we think it's important, for example, that some of the comments that are made in proficiency checks uh, that really help you better understand your flight operations and improve safety should not necessarily be part of a permanent record as you move forward in through the general aviation rank. So we work with, with Capitol Hill, we work with regulators, we work with state governments as well as federal governments, but we also work hard to promote a positive image, an accurate image of business aviation. That's a fundamental part of being association is being able to project the public image of the industry you represent. And we're really fortunate at NBAA to represent a very special industry. Um, business aviation, as we like to tell people, uh, is responsible for jobs, great jobs. Uh, the kind of jobs that we can keep in the United States throughout the 21st century, the kind of job base we can grow. Today, there's over 1.1 million people involved in our community. So whether it's pilot jobs, maintenance jobs, schedulers and dispatchers, journalists, lawyers, financiers, there are a lot of great jobs associated with business aviation. So we wanna make sure that policymakers and opinion leaders know the benefit of business aviation to our nation's job base, to our manufacturing base, to our economic engine. We also talk a lot about how business aviation provides economic development, particularly in some of those small towns and rural communities that may not uh, have access to uh, a good hub airline service. So I mentioned some of our member companies like Jack Link's Beef Jerky, uh, I've talked about companies like Red Wing Boots in rural Minnesota. Uh, there are a number of companies throughout the United States that are able to locate outside of major cities because that's where they want to be. And I think we're all experiencing that right now as, as COVID um, is allowing people to work from anywhere. What we're seeing is a lot of people would choose not to live full time in major metropolitan areas, that a lot of people enjoy the small town and rural communities. And so business aviation helps allow companies to be located um, in anywhere the company wants and use that aircraft to access the global marketplace. So business aviation creates jobs, it spurs economic development. It also helps companies be very efficient and productive. You know, when you look at business aviation, you know, you, it allows you to do three visits in one day instead of one visit in three days. It allows you to discuss proprietary information while your team is en route. So it can turn travel time into very productive work time. You can take products on board that may be too big to fit in an overhead bin or too sensitive to fit in a cargo hold. So business aviation is a important business tools that allows companies to be very efficient and productive. They can bring customers to them or they can go out and see customers. They can have their employees home at night to sleep in their own bed. 
it is also good for shareholders. One of the things that we've done at NBAA is for nearly 25 years, we've been doing constant studies that look at uh, two companies in the same industry, one that uses a business aircraft and one that does not. What we have found consistently is that companies that use business aviation perform better for shareholders than companies that do not. And this is true when the economy is growing or when the economy is shrinking. It doesn't matter if it's a domestic company or an international company. Great companies rely on business aviation to meet at least some portion of their transportation needs. We've had you know, the data to show that. If you look at a list of great companies, and it can be defined a lot of ways, best returns for shareholders, best places to work, most admired brands, whatever the list, if you look at it, you'll see whether it's 10, 25, 100, at least 90% of the companies you see will be utilizing business aviation for some portion of their transportation needs. They know that it's efficient, that it's productive. In some cases, it's the best mode of transportation. In some cases, it's the only mode of transportation. But great companies utilize business aviation to be efficient and productive. Of course, we also like to talk about the fact that business aviation does a lot of humanitarian flights. Companies that own aircraft are routinely volunteering their airplanes to take cancer patients to treatment centers, to reunite combat veterans with their families, to move transplant organs to hospitals, to respond to wildfires in California or hurricanes and floods along the Gulf Coast. Business aviation is always there in times of humanitarian need. We consistently step up to the plate. So these are some of the things that may not always be known about business aviation. They may not always be understood about business aviation. We find that a lot of people like to caricature, uh, put out a caricature of business aviation that is at odds with the reality. So we like to talk about who we really are. And at NBA, we're 11,000 members, most of them small and mid-sized companies you haven't heard of. They're providing jobs and economic development all across the United States. They're helping companies be competitive in the global marketplace. And they're doing humanitarian flights routinely every time there's a natural disaster or just as part of everyday life. So it's a good industry. It's an exciting industry. It's an essential industry. And we're pleased to be able to represent it, to work with lawmakers and regulators, policymakers and opinion leaders to help them understand who business aviation is and why it's so important to the United States and to the world. What I wanted to do today is take a little bit of time, not just to explain to you who business aviation is, but to talk a little bit about why I think you should be part of our industry. And I think it gets to the fact that, you know, when, when we look at what we are going to do with our lives, our career, our job, it is in a lot of ways most satisfying and most meaningful when it reflects who we are and what we want to do. And I think in that respect, business aviation has a tremendous amount to offer people who are coming out of college looking to make a meaningful difference with their life. The good news on it is that it is an industry that is technology rich. We utilize advanced avionics. We operate uh, in, in, a, in a system that values uh, gadgets. Uh, we like technology and general aviation is often on the cutting edge. A lot of times, with the airlines, for example, they've got to make a decision, an appropriate business decision to equip hundreds of aircraft. So when they buy something, they look at it times 200, 300. Business aviation a lot of times is looking at one or two or three aircraft. 
which changes the formula on what types of technology are we going to invest in? How updated are we going to keep the cockpit and the um, communication system? What's the connectivity levels on the aircraft? So we're an industry that values and deploys technology. Perhaps a lot more important than that, we're also an industry that values community. A big part of what NBAA does is brings people together. We provide a lot of conferences and a lot of conventions where we bring people together from all over the United States, from all over the world. NBA does conventions in Asia, in Europe, and in the United States. And what we found is as we bring people together, something magic happens. They make friends, they find peer groups, they find support teams, and they become part of a very important community of business aviation professionals. And finding that community, finding a place to belong, finding a place that values you is really something extraordinary. At NBAA, we work hard to do it, but it's also a natural part of who our community is. We tend to be open. We tend to be engaging. You know, if you are at a general aviation airport, it's not unusual for someone to walk up and say, well, is that your aircraft? What are you flying? Tell me about yourself. There's a sense that there is someone here who's going to understand me. And at NBAA, we try to capture the passion of business aviation and connect the people. Our most recent effort to do that uh, took place just last week when NBAA celebrated 40 professionals under the age of 40. And we were uh, really proud and pleased uh, to have uh, Will uh, as part of that. So uh, he did a, a mag magnificent job. So uh, uh, Will uh, was, was there in front of the Auburn uh, aircraft and had an opportunity uh, to talk about uh, what aviation meant to him. But more importantly, he got to now be part of a class with 30 nine other professionals. He's got a network. He's got a community. He's part of something. Um, and so uh, that that is a big part of what business aviation brings to the table. So you can work with technology. You can be part of a community. We're also an industry that focuses a lot on personal growth, helping you not just have a job, but have an opportunity to grow as a personal and professional in everything you do. At NBAA, we talked about how we were created after World War II to help create professionalism, enhance professionalism in our industry. And we do that today by offering numerous professional development courses, numerous conferences where you can learn more about leadership, uh, or about maintenance, about scheduling and dispatch. All of the conferences help you grow as a professional and help you find that community, the network of mentors that you can work with, uh, peers that you can work with. So it's about technology, it's about community, it's about personal growth. It's also a lot about experiences the opportunity to do something new and something different. You know, there are roughly 500 commercial airports in the United States. And a lot of times when you fly for a commercial airline, you'll find yourself operating to and from a handful of airports. After a while, they kind of all become, all begin to look the same. In the business aviation community, you have an opportunity to access over 5,000 airports, and that's just in the United States. So you may find yourself one day in a big city and one day in a small town. You may uh, eat at a, at a glamorous restaurant in New York City, or you may be at a, at a barbecue joint uh, in Texas. Um, there's a lot that changes in terms of the operating environment, how you operate, where you operate, it is much more, in my opinion, experiential. 
you'll have an opportunity to do the humanitarian flights. You'll have an opportunity to be involved in a greater part of the planning and uh, all phases of the flight. You won't be a specialist. You'll have an opportunity to experience a very broad um, uh, group of challenges. And that really is, is a, an opportunity to grow as a person. The more challenges you meet, the more you grow. And I think business aviation provides a number of unique challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. I've already talked about some of the humanitarian efforts you might be able to participate in, the opportunity to give back. Uh, another point that we uh, wanna focus on in business aviation, and we're anxious to have uh, a, a focus and, and, and push in new and different ways is of course in sustainability. Now business aviation has long been involved in sustainability. We were the first segment of the aviation community that really engaged in composite technology. Uh, we were early adapters of winglets, for example, uh, to improve the efficiency of the aircraft. We've been involved in a number of propulsion systems. We were early adopters of GPS uh, navigation. Uh, but more recently, involved in, in a very important effort related to sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, fuel that is safe, but it is also uh, a, a mix of traditional aviation fuel and biofuels that dramatically reduces our environmental footprint. We're in the early stages with sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, we're trying to accelerate the production of the SAF, we're also trying to accelerate the adoption of SAF. But we believe this combination is going to offer an exciting pathway forward. And of course, we have all of the exciting breakthroughs that appear to be very imminent in terms of electric propulsion, hybrid propulsion, maybe even hydrogen propulsion. So there is a lot going on in our industry uh, with regard to uh, sustainable, efforts, uh, technology, uh, and, and the other benefits that I talked about, including the sense of community, the experiences, and the personal growth. So uh, I'm going to, uh, to take an opportunity uh, now, Elton, to, to maybe take some questions from you and the class. Uh, but the point, the point that I would make at this point in my presentation is that business aviation is a great industry. It's an essential industry. And all of us who have been blessed to be part of it are proud of the friends that we've been able to develop, the experiences we've been able to have, and the passion that is evident in everything we do. So for the best and the brightest coming out of great universities like Auburn, this is an industry that we hope you will consider. We hope you'll be part of it. We would like to work with you to find internships, to find scholarships, to find opportunities, because we know if we can get the best and brightest to be part of our industry, we can do great things for our country and for the world. So thank you very much. Okay, at this time, I would like for those members of my class that have a question, for Ed to take the opportunity. Uh, I'm not gonna call on people. I expect you all to be ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so I suggest that to cue you up that you say Mr. Bowling and then ask your question. So at this time, is there a question for Ed? I'd like to uh, present a question for you. Yeah. I wanted to say thank you first off for coming out and talking to us. But my question relates specifically to COVID. So yeah. during COVID, commercial aviation and aviation as a whole has been hit pretty hard, but business aviation has seen to pull through and expand. Um, specifically earlier in the year, the president of NetJets stated that May was on track to be their best month in 10 years. Um, where I go from that is how do you see business aviation growing out of this? And do you think there will be um, excuse me. 
do you think there will be more people looking to invest in business aviation, whether it be for company or personal travel? Well, uh, thanks, David. Yeah, the uh, first of all, let me take it at a macro level, and then we'll get down a little bit more. A macro level, clearly, the commercial airlines have been hit very, very hard. They have been down somewhere between 50 and 85 percent. Business aviation as a whole dropped down substantially after the March lockdown. And somewhere in the April timeframe, as some of the states began to lift restrictions, we saw some of that coming back. Today, business aviation as a whole, in terms of overall traffic, is down about 15 or 20 percent from where we were before. So it's a challenging environment. We're down in double digits from where we were. Relative <clears throat> to the airlines, it's been a much smoother recovery. And within that recovery, what we have seen is that some pockets, including fractional ownership, subscription companies, and charter operations, have done really quite well, whereas some of the other operations have been down a little bit. The mix has been a little more skewed toward personal travel than business travel, the other way around. So there's, it, it's, been a, it, it's been a mixed recovery, it's been a different recovery, but all things considered, I think we have weathered the COVID storm um, as well or maybe better than most industries. The question that you ask is really a good one. It's where do we go from here? And I think a couple of things. One, we know that as the economy goes, so goes transportation. Anytime the economy is expanding, we see additional auto miles traveled, rail miles traveled, air miles traveled. And that permeates uh, all segments, including general aviation and commercial aviation. So a lot of our recovery is going to be economy based. But we also have an opportunity, I think, to take people who are experiencing the benefits of business aviation for the first time, perhaps even at a personal level, and be able to plant the seed that this tool can help you achieve some of the benefits we talked about earlier. Go more places in less time, discuss proprietary information in route, spend more time at home, bring in your customers. I think people are going to have an opportunity to experience firsthand business aviation, and I'm confident that is going to lead to additional growth down the road. So I do think in every crisis there is an opportunity, and I think this is one of those opportunities. Another thing I see that I talked about is the, is the advances that are happening in technology, the ability to fly further, to fly faster, uh, to fly more sustainably, uh, potentially to, uh, to adapt to some of these new electric and hybrid propulsion systems. I think the technologies are moving in our favor, uh, and I think the benefits are becoming very real. So I am very bullish on the future of business aviation. Thank you. Next question. I've got one. Um, so earlier earlier in the year, I, I was uh, scrolling through an article about a supersonic air crash making a, making a uh, comeback. Uh, do you think that supersonic air, air crash will make a comeback? Comeback, and if so, how will that affect business aviation? Well, I think uh, there is a lot of investment going on in supersonic. Uh, we have a number of companies that are working towards certification right now. Uh, Arion, which is out of Melbourne, Florida. Uh, is a Boeing company uh, that is working at it. There's been a lot of focus on Boom out in Colorado uh, and a number of other companies that are focused on supersonic travel um, and particularly focused on smaller aircraft than what we saw in the Concorde. Key to that is making sure that we understand what the regulatory environment is uh, right now, you're not allowed to fly supersonic over 
uh, over land because of the sonic boom. But what we're seeing is a lot of companies are working to change the sonic boom into a sonic whisper, which may give us an opportunity to revise some of the sonic boom regulations. Uh, we're also looking at some of the fuel they're using. For example, Arion, which I mentioned, is going to uh, be able to fly exclusively on sustainable aviation fuel. So I think those are game changers. We're, we clearly operate Robert, in a global marketplace. And I think that despite what we're learning about virtual technology, that business is going to continue to be built on relationships. Relationships build best when they're face-to-face. -face. And so I think there will continue to be a need to travel and reducing total travel time, doing it in ways that uh, do not have a negative environmental impact are important steps forward. And I think we're on the cusp of that. I think you see a lot of companies that are investing in it and they're doing so because they understand there's a demand for it. So uh, I, think, uh, I think there's a pretty clear vision. I think there's a lot of smart people and they're working on uh, relatively uh, well understood technology. So I think we will see some breakthroughs there. Thank you. Someone else, please. I'll ask a question. Go right ahead. What do you think will be a lasting impact or something that you'll always have to keep implementing because of the pandemic and the virus in business aviation? Positive or negative, whichever one. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's kind of, uh, I think it's positive uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, NBAA, business aviation, all of aviation and a lot of businesses focus on continuous improvement. Wherever we are, we want to get better. And so whether it's safety or health safety, I think we take whatever the state of art is, we find it, but then we are understanding what the problem is we're trying to solve for and we try to do it. So I think business aviation has been pretty quick to understand what is it we need to do in terms of disinfecting an aircraft or how do we pair our teams to do maintenance? And we're learning as we go, but we're able to share our experiences and benchmark from it. So as health conscious as we were six months ago, we're a lot more health conscious now and we'll be able to take those lessons with us as we go forward. So I think it'll be a constant learning experience for us, but I think it also gives an opportunity for us to build on some of our foundational benefits. You know, with business aviation, you basically are operating with um, a small population of people. Uh, generally, they're known. Uh, the aircraft is not necessarily doing a quick turn. Uh, so I think some of those inherent benefits, the fact that, you know, on a commercial airline, you may have 800 touch points, whereas business aviation may have uh, one or two dozen touch points, is an opportunity to focus on our inherent strengths, but also move forward and find ways to reduce whatever that exposure is. Uh, and so I think that's the opportunity going forward. We, we know how important aircraft safety is from an operational standpoint. Now we're learning more about what the health environment is and how we improve it. I don't think it's dissimilar to what we did in terms of security post 9-11. Once we understand what the problem is, our ability to solve for the problem gets continuously better and makes our industry stronger as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Someone else? Yes. Um, hello. I am just wondering what the most impressive change you've seen in business aviation since you became president and CEO. Well, uh, I've, uh, I've been in the industry now for 25 years, so I've seen uh, a number of, of changes taking place. Um, you know, when I entered the industry, there were about three categories of aircraft. We called them small, uh, uh, medium, and, and large. We've now got everything from 
uh, personal jet aircraft to uh, what we call biz liners, uh, the 737s and 787s that are configured for business travel. So the whole spectrum of business aviation aircraft has changed. We've also changed the way you utilize that or get access to it. Um, we've seen the development of fractional programs, of jet cards, uh, subscription services. Uh, so there are a number of different ways to access it. So one of the, the striking differences is how many more solutions we can offer that are well customized for what the challenge is. We have the right aircraft and the right utilization strategy. So that has grown kind of exponentially. The technology has advanced, uh, uh, certainly uh, going through the whole rise of technology and the advancement of the cl class cockpits, uh, the use of uh, GPS uh, are, are now going to an ADSB environment in the NAS. That has all been significant. But I think the thing that I am most excited about is the commitment that our community is making to try to enhance the diversity and inclusion within our industry to be able to recognize uh, some of the early pioneers, whether it's the WASP or the 99s or the Tuskegee Airmen, but to recognize that while aviation has a long and storied history, the reality is there is a lot of room to grow in terms of who we're bringing into the industry, the perspectives that are being heard, where we're finding people in the industry. And my sense is that our our industry is changing before our eyes and we hope we can stimulate that. We hope we can do more uh, from that, but I think that's a big development that's taking place. And then also the, uh, the technologies that we see going forward, that you've got drone technologies, advanced air mobility, supersonic, commercial space launch. There's just a number of ways the technology is changing. So uh, I'm very excited about all of it. I think we've got great technology, we've got great people, uh, and we've got a, a great opportunity. And how do we marry that all together? So best of all of that in a way that allows everybody to bring their best and authentic self forward, whether it's a, a person or a technology, so that we can all operate in an integrated way, uh, safely and leveraging each other's strengths. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mackenzie. Anyone? Yeah, I got one if I may. Yeah, go ahead, Jordan. All right, I guess, Jordan, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Oh. Um, I recently saw an article on the NBA website talking about the FAA streamlining the modernization of commercial space travel. Um, how near in the future do you think uh, commercial space travel will be a major player in the aviation industry? And how would that coincide with um, business aviation? Well, it's certainly happening, uh, I think, faster than people thought it would happen three or four years ago. Uh, so I think when you see things like SpaceX taking, uh, taking astronauts to the International Space Station, uh, there's a lot of excitement about what is going on. When you see the kind of money that is being put into it from Elon Musk, from uh, Amazon, uh, from Richard Branson, the clarity of their vision for the future. Uh, you have to believe things are going to happen and happen quickly. Generally, when you have a clear vision, you have brilliant and passionate people, and you have a lot of money, things tend to happen and things are happening in commercial space. And I think that's great. I think it fires the imagination. I think it opens people's minds and possibilities. So I'm very excited about the future for commercial space launch. I think what we need to do is make sure we understand how we all work together. Uh, right now, for example, for a commercial space launch, you have to block off a huge amount of airspace. Um, that worked fine back in the day when NASA would uh, a couple times a year fire something off. I think we're now saying that those might be a couple of times a day. So I think we still have a lot of work to do to figure out how we all share airspace. 
and operate in ways that we can be safe um, and facilitate our operations without uh, harming or delaying others. So there's a lot of work to do, but I think the uh, rapid advancement, kind of the trial and error that we're seeing by doing the launches, doing more launches, putting them up, bringing them down, it's pretty breathtaking to see. So, um, you know, I'll leave it for Elon and uh, Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson to make the exact predictions, but I think the reality is something's gonna happen um, and, it's, and it's gonna be great. Thank you. Uh, if I could just ask a quick follow-up, have you had any yeah. kind of personal experience uh, with commercial space aviation? Well, I've certainly uh, I've certainly been uh, in the room where Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos uh, have sat in front of aviation groups and talked about their vision, and certainly felt the uh, the goosebumps that have been part of that. Uh, I also had an opportunity two years ago at the NBAA convention in Orlando. Jeff Bezos came to our convention. He walked around uh, our convention center, so I had an opportunity to talk with him, and that, uh, that has been a goosebump-inducing uh, conversation. Uh, I've also worked on some of the NAS issues and the MITRE issues on how we handle the airspace and so forth. But uh, I have yet to uh, to visit a, a, a commercial space launch uh, or uh, toured their facilities. I'm looking forward to it, though. Thank you. Alex, go ahead and ask your question. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, again, Mr. Bowen, thank you for your time this morning. We all know how busy you are. Um, but as to as soon to be a recent college graduate here in December, uh, my classmates and I are about to enter a slimmer than normal job market compared to recent years. Um, you know, on the NBAA website this morning, and I've looked at it quite often the last couple of weeks or so, um, I saw there are about 130 jobs available that numbers might have changed since I've last looked. Um, and only two are located in Atlanta, and I saw one was in Birmingham. Um, and majority of these jobs are, you know, pilot intensive, you know, looking for pilots with thousands of hours, various type ratings, um, as well as there are some A&P mechanic positions available on there. Um, so my, I have a two part question. My first one is, what would be your advice to soon to be college graduate students that are going into this kind of job market? Um, and my second one is, do you have any predictions or an outlook for the next NBAA convention, which I believe is going to be in Las Vegas or if it's heading back to Orlando? Um, any information would be great. Okay, well, uh, a couple of things. First, Alex, thanks for, thanks for looking at NBAA's jobs board. Uh, we do encourage people to post their jobs on that. It may not, however, be as extensive as the opportunities. And the reason I say that is you tend, as you point out, it's pretty heavy on looking for pilots or ANPs. What you don't see as much is the, we're looking for someone who's interested in uh, journalism or finance or law or many of the other places where people can have the opportunity to practice a discipline but do it in the backdrop of aviation. So it's not dissimilar to saying, well, there's professional sports, you're either going to play or you're going to coach. The fact is there are ticket sales and contract negotiations and a lot of other stuff that goes on and, and we certainly have that. I think uh, what my my suggestion would be is stay engaged with NBAA. Over the course of the last couple of years, we've changed from being you have to be a company to be a member to now you can be an individual. We've got a special student membership and try to, to use NBAA, either the website or the personnel, to make connections to knock on doors to see what is available. A lot of times the world just opens up in strange and different ways. Uh, for me, I was working on Capitol Hill and the senator I work for said, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna change product liability laws and you're gonna be the staffer that handles that. I didn't look to be part of the aviation community, but I was certainly blessed that that happened to me. And believe me, once in, uh, I never want to let go of being part of this community with so much passion. So uh, I think it will require us to, will require 
the class of uh, 2020 and 2021 to be creative, to be uh, relentless, but certainly in our community, we want to be open. We want to bring in new talent. Um, that was a commitment we made long before COVID. In fact, Joe D'Amato, who is on uh, this call, uh, is the head of our workforce development. And so it's a big part of what we want to do going forward. And Alex, we want, we want you to be part of the business aviation community. Thank you so much. Anybody else? One, two, well, but, three. Well, but before you cut off the questions, maybe I could uh, ask Will Levy a, to, uh, to talk a little bit about his experience with 40 under 40 and uh, uh, what, he, what, what he sees in NBAA and what he sees in the business aviation community. Yeah, Go ahead, man, Will. Thanks, uh, Hey guys, um, thank you again, Ed, for uh, doing this. It's, it's great to have you here and it's great to see uh, Christy and Joe on the call and everything. And, um, I, you know, I think this is uh, just another one of those great options out there. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, a lot of our, especially our young alumni, uh, myself included, uh, the opportunities are out there. Um, it's not as impossible as, as you may think. Um, with the help of folks like Christy and Joe and, and uh, our extensive alumni base here at Auburn, um, you know, it, it's, 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 not that, it's not that difficult if you want to go off and fly Gulf Streams in five years and um, you got to work hard at it, but um, it's doable. So I think uh, kind of like you said, just maintaining those connections is, is absolutely in business. Uh, you never know who who's going to build you up um, and uh, and maintaining those uh, connections throughout your career is is uh, probably the best thing you can do but but um, but I'm, I'm always open and I, I've talked to a lot of our students and uh, uh, I keep in touch with a lot of our alumni and um, a lot of our non alumni that are wanting to get interested in in Auburn aviation and uh, and um, I know myself and them, they're always open to help and answer questions and, um, and help the next people in line, so. Thanks, Will. Well, since I don't hear any other questions coming from the students, I've got one for you, Ed. All right, Elton. As, and realize that I've been in the aviation business for 45, 43 years in some form or another, but from your position as the CEO and president of MBAA, what would you recommend to these young men and women out here that are on the cusp of joining our ranks in the working world? What would you recommend that they do to set themselves apart from somebody else? Let's say in the interview process, in the networking process, or along those lines. Well, I think Elton, you know, whether you're uh, a company or whether you're an individual, how you tell your story uh, is important. And I think the, the thing people are interested in now, which is really exciting, is I think there's a lot more interest now in people hearing the whole complete story about who you are and what motivates you. I think that the transition that I've seen over the last decade or so has been a little bit less of show me your resume and what you have done to a little more of an open question. Well, what do you want to do? What motivates you? Do you have a commitment to learning? Are you interested in other people? Do you want to constantly grow and experience things? And so I think the, the world is changing a little bit from, well, what's your degree? What are your hours? What are your certificates to who are you? And how you tell that story that suggests that you are someone who is gonna be all in, uh, that you're willing to do your best and do your part, uh, that you care about your community, your profession, uh, you care about making a difference and having a purpose. 
And I think that really, uh, that really is fundamental uh, to everybody today. Um, we want to know that you want to grow, that you're up for the challenge, that you're, you're all in, whatever it is. We want to know you're in. You're willing to do your best and you're willing to do your part. And so I think that would be uh, just in terms of making the pitch. A big part of it, however, is how do you get the opportunity to make the pitch in the and, you know, I think that's what we were talking about, about being active, uh, joining organizations, leveraging opportunities. I noticed when uh, we were just talking, uh, Joe talked about, you know, volunteering is a good way to build, uh, build a network or build a community. I think all of those things, that the, the, more you're, the more you're active and engaged, the more opportunities are that you are going to engage with people who have the opportunity to change your life. Uh, and I think it's okay to be open about that. If you are looking for a mentor, if you're looking for an advisor, if you're looking for a support uh, network, those things are things we're all looking for right now. I, I think part of the COVID environment is telling all of us we're human beings. We want to need each other. We don't like the idea of being isolated. We like the opportunity to communicate, to contribute, to make ourselves happy and healthy in our community the same way. So I, I think it's about being engaged, um, being active, um, and understanding you've got a great story to tell. Think through about how you're gonna tell that story in ways that suggest um, that you're gonna make a meaningful difference for, uh, for a company that you're going to, uh, that you take your life and your work seriously. It's a reflection of who you are and you're committed to being your best self. Thank you, Ed. That, you, you went right where I wanted you to go and I didn't even have to give you guidance. What can I tell you? Uh, ladies and I gentlemen. Never listen to, I never listen to my professors anyway, Elton. <laughs> And let, let me jump in on that one. I heard you, Ed. Uh, and right now, we're taking a hard look at the aviation program at Auburn. And what we're trying to do is expand and diversify in an effort to make our students more identifiably employable once they leave here. One of the things we're looking at is teaming up with Southern Union to provide an airplane power plant mechanics rating. I'm a commercial pilot. I've got an A&P license. The last thing you want is to have me work on your aircraft. But I can talk to the people who do, and that has value. We're uh, exploring the idea of a certificate in aviation hospitality, giving people a jump on the application when they apply to the airlines for uh, the hospitality industry in aviation. Uh, there are several other programs, sub-programs that we're looking at, uh, our drone program. Auburn has the oldest certified drone program in the United States. And we want to do more than just train people to fly drones, but expand that program to talk about implementation, the different industries, etc. What are your views from your position as to an individual applying to you with a variety of skills, as opposed to simply focusing on ratings and logbook. Well, Dr. Whitty, I'm, I'm really impressed uh, by the idea of aviation hospitality. Uh, I also think you're, when, when you talk about your background, I think you're, you're rotocraft, fixed wing, commercial, you, you've kind of done everything there is in aviation, but I think what you're recognizing is that you have an under, a broad understanding and an ability to communicate. And I, and I think that's an important part um, of, of telling our story is helping communicating and facilitating some of those softer skills uh, that are important. Communication teaching is, is about connecting with somebody else 
and, and helping them grow and learn themselves. And so I think what you're talking about is helping someone, helping an employer know you are committed to growing as a professional. You're committed not just to saying, I hit the numbers, I have it, you need to hire me because I'm a 4.0 student. Uh, or this is my, uh, you know, SAT score, you have to let me in. That's not the way the world really works. A lot of the world is looking at who wants to keep learning, who wants to keep themselves challenged, who wants to give more than we even ask. Uh, those are some of the questions that may or may not be stated, but they're on the table with every job interview. Um, it's not tell me what you've done and we're going to hire you to do that. It's we don't know what the future holds but we want to know that we're with people that have uh, the discipline, uh, the capacity uh, to learn and to become experts, but also be part of a team. Uh, if you're in the left suite, who's in the right seat, vice versa. If you're, if you're part of a, if you're on a task force, you're on a management team, who are you working with? We need new and different perspectives. We need people to bring themselves, but we need them also to be able to communicate and share and learn and grow together. And I think that's what you're getting at, Dr. Whitty, and I think it's great. Well, I appreciate that. Sometimes you feel like you're reaching out on a limb and uh, hopefully the, the people you're looking at on this screen are the ones that are gonna make the difference. They're, they're the ones that no want doubt. and start doing it. And, uh, uh, one other thing in terms of faculty here at Auburn, as in most aviation faculties, every single one of the people here have worked outside of the academics. But the thing that impresses me is, is their current rise in contribution to things academically. We have major grants underway with FAA and others. I've got at least four faculty members working on publications, and that all descends down to the student body. Uh, we're actually getting ready to publish with students, so we're doing everything we can to set our program apart. Well, and I think you, you said something really important about the faculty, uh, and that is they've worked elsewhere, they've done different yeah. things, but where they are right now is where they want to be. <laughs> they, want to, they, they, they want to be at Auburn. They want to be teaching. They're in a field that matters to them. They're passionate about them. And I, I, and I think that's important. That's the kind of person you want is not someone that says, well, I've been on this track, so I just keep going down this track. You, you want people that are saying, I'm willing to take periods where I look around and say, where do I want to be? What do I want to do? What, how can I best contribute? Where can I make a difference? Um, and so if the faculty is there because they want to be and they want to share the experiences they have had in the military side or the commercial side, that is all to the good. Um, and I think uh, that's when great things happen, when people are where they want to be, doing what they want to do and help others succeed. I'm impressed. Thank you. Well, on that note, Ed, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, class time is about out. And I want to thank Joe, Christy, for helping us make this uh, a very viable event for the students here at Auburn. And I look forward to the time that uh, we can get back and have the airplanes on the ramp and the uh, exhibitors in the FBO or somewhere else and do it face to face. and. I hope, Ed, that uh, once we get to that level that you will be take time out of your busy schedule and join us. War Eagle. <laughs>